Well, welcome back. Now we're starting Lecture 7, which is Radar, Clutter, and Chaff, and it's Lecture 7 in the Introduction to Radar Systems course. Okay, back again to the radar block diagram. Uh, you see here at the antenna, and uh, emitting radiation and receiving back some backscatter. Well, what is radar clutter? We see where you've got a target out there, an aircraft, and it has a target cross-section, and an echo will come back from that. But there are an awful lot of other objects out in the environment that the radar's beam will intersect, interact with, scatter off of, and radiation will come back, backscatter will come back to the antenna, and it will be received by the radar. And all this unwanted backscatter from real physical objects out there in the environment are what we call radar clutter. In this cartoon, we see that we've just got some buildings noted. One of the forms is backscatter from the ground. So let's look in detail at what all the different kinds of radar clutter are. Okay, well why study radar clutter? Well, when people built the first radars, they found that not only did they get back echoes from the target of interest, that's what we want, but they also, of course, got rece received, received receiver noise. There was noise from the atmosphere. And then, if other radars were operating nearby, cooperative radars that might be from a nearby airport if, uh, or mil other military radars nearby, uh, you could get interference from those radars, unwanted man-made electromagnetic interference. And also jammers. Um, if you were operating in a wartime environment, in order to degrade your radar, the enemy might turn on large noise jammers to degrade the performance of your radar. Because if you remember earlier, the radar echoes that we're looking for are very, very weak. And so if you could raise the noise floor, the uh, targets would be well above that, noise, uh, well below the noise level with the jammers. But these, are, these, these kinds of noise issues aren't what we're going to be talking about today. Today we're going to be talking about backscatter from unwanted objects, backscatter from the ground, sea, rain, chaff, birds, and ground traffic. Now this cartoon of a naval air defense scenario shows quite vividly um, in a pictorial way how all these different uh, backscatter entities can come into play. Uh, say we have a radar located on a ship and uh, uh, the ship can be located near land, we call the littoral environment, and it, it could, uh, along with detecting aircraft or say a, a missile over in this direction. Uh, the beams as they scan back and forth can see targets uh, that are made up of ground, hill, hilly areas, uh, grassy areas, or buildings. So quite first thing we're noticing is the ground can be quite different in the backscatter that it presents. Uh, if, it, if you're operating uh, on a ship, certainly some backscatter will come with your, your low elevation beams will come from the sea. Uh, if you are a, uh, a land-based radar and you're lo located near the water, you can also get sea returns, backscatter returns from the sea. And we all know that it rains sometimes, and rain is made up of little droplets of water. And when you have lots of them, rain coming down, uh, you know, half an inch an hour, quarter of an inch an hour, there's enough of it within the radar's volume that it can do quite a devastating uh, effect on radars, as we'll see when we look at the characteristics of rain backscatter. And then there's chaff. Uh, developed during World War II, it consists of uh, uh, dipoles, which are half wavelength long pieces of aluminum or aluminized mylar. And, these, and the, the, the length of the dipole is tuned, that is to say it's uh, set so the wavelength uh, of the dipole, its half wavelength corresponds to the radar that it wants to inundate and do damage to. Uh, 
and during World War II, uh, bombers would have big cartons of aluminized mar uh, aluminum foil that they would throw out the windows and uh, to confuse uh, radars. In fact, there were German radars when the Allies were bombing uh, Germany from Great Britain. Um, and then there were also birds. And this sometimes can be a, people say birds, a chuckle factor, you know. But in fact, and we'll show in detail a little later, uh, small objects uh, like birds, particularly when there are um, there can be hundreds of thousands of them during migration times within the coverage of the radar. By the end of this briefing you won't think it's a chuckle factor. And particularly with the advent of uh, uh, people in the military environment making uh, aircraft cross sections that are smaller and smaller than clutter, which whose innate cross section is smaller and is small, comes into play more. And then there's ground traffic. Well, you might say, well, gee, how can ground traffic be a really big problem? Well, you might be a radar that's uh, located uh, in a relatively flat area, and a few miles, five, five, ten miles away, there might be uh, a hilly area that an interstate highway goes over. And every couple of seconds, or, or an interstate winds along the top of a, of a hilly ridge. Uh, those um, automobiles will have a significant cross-section and also they'll be moving. So they'll have a Doppler frequency that can mimic the Doppler frequency of a small Cherokee, Piper Cherokee flying around in your coverage. Uh, because uh, Piper Cherokees, although they go 100, 150 miles an hour, they're not always going straight towards you. They can be going tangentially or roughly tangentially and they can have low radio velocity. So all these different objects come into play and now what we're going to do is we're going to look at each one of these objects one at a time and the reason we're spending a whole lecture on radar clutter is to understand the problem. Because this is lecture 7, lecture 8 is solving the problem with the Doppler processing. So first, in order to solve a problem, you just have to understand the nature of the problem. And so what we're going to do is go understand the nature and the characteristics of each of these different effects. Okay, let's first start with ground clutter, backscatter from the ground. Okay. And if I only had two sentences to say about ground clutter, um, uh, I'd say it's large, and it doesn't have a very big Doppler, but it can have a Doppler. And let's go over what, a little bit more what I mean by that. Uh, we characterize ground clutter by its mean backscatter. Okay? And as I just mentioned, uh, the backscatter from the ground, uh, it can be very, very large relative to an aircraft. It can be 10 or 100,000 times larger than the aircraft that you want to detect. So we're going to have to use some other principle, and I've alluded to the Doppler principle, as a means of, of seeing aircraft in the presence of this very large, and uh, uh, relatively stationary um, uh, backscatter. Uh, and I say relatively stationary, I don't mean that the ground moves for ground-based radars, but you'll see a little later if the radar is moving because it's on a ship or an aircraft, then the ground clutter does move relative to the radar, and that makes a difference. The next point about the uh, ground clutter is that the backscatter that you get varies an awful lot, and the best way to characterize this is to do it statistically, because um, uh, it, it, you just can't make a deterministic, a simple deterministic model of where the ground clutter will be. It's not an easy thing to do. And ground clutter varies with the frequency of the radiation that the radar is emitting. It varies with the spatial resolution of the radar. If you're looking at a big patch of the ground with a big resolution cell in space and range in azimuth, you're going to see more backscatter. It varies with the geometry, how the radar is set up relative 
to the geometry of the ground. Um, if you're uh, on a hill and looking down into a, uh, a valley region, uh, you're going to get a higher back scatter from the ground than if you're in a, a grassy plain of Kansas and for the most part the, the ground's clutter you see is going to be at a very slight grazing angle. And it's going to depend an awful lot on terrain type. You can imagine the back scatter from buildings which have a man-made objects which have a, a, a perpendicular aspect to the radar beam that's going to have a higher cross-section than, as I just said, flatlands of Kansas or a hilly uh, terrain or mountainous terrain like the Rocky Mountains. Now, I alluded a little bit earlier to the Doppler characteristics of ground clutter. You might say, ground clutter, hmm, if you're on the ground, it doesn't move. Well, trees are on the ground, and trees do have some conductivity and they move back and forth with the wind so that there will be a spread to the Doppler, a spread to the radial velocity distribution when we look at the Doppler distribution of the echoes coming back from the ground. It's only a few knots. It's only a few knots. Now, one class of antennas, if you've ever been out to an airport and you've seen an antenna go around and around, they go around at 12 RPM about once every five seconds, now just imagine, say, 10 miles away from that radar, there's a big, a big chimney from a power plant. And as the radar goes by that chimney, it's emitting pulses. And a typical air traffic control radar will emit pulses approximately 1,000 times a second. And so that impinging upon that tower will be about 20 pulses. The, the pulses in the middle of the 20, around 10 or 11, the antenna would be pointed exactly at the tower. And the ones near 1, 2, 3, or 18, 19, 20 pulses, the, the antenna is going to be off to the side, and the beam pattern of the antenna is going to be down a lot. What that does is that um, modulates, we call it. It varies the backscatter due to that tower as a function of time as we scan past the tower. And that amplitude modulation of the echoes that we process will convert into the Doppler frequency domain into a spread, a Doppler spread. Now, I mentioned that the innate Doppler spread of, say, trees is a few knots. Well, that chimney, which doesn't move at all, when it has an antenna scanning by it at 12 RPM, that in, you see a spread of 12 knots, of 10 to 12 knots. Okay? And, uh, and this is at S band, and I'm picking numbers from history. So that you can have a Doppler spread to ground clutter, which doesn't move because of that mechanical scanning of the antenna. Now, the other area which gives ground clutter uh, a Doppler shift when you illuminate it is if the, and the um, radar is not on the ground. The, it can be on a ship or on an aircraft. And what the Doppler effect measures is the relative vo radial velocity relative to the radar. So if the radar is moving at 30 knots, it's 10 miles offshore, and it's looking at a building, and the ship is leaving port, that Doppler shift is going to be 30 knots for the buildings, the ground clutter. And the radar processing has to accommodate that, those differences, those shifts. Of course, if you're on an aircraft and you're moving Mach 1, the clutter can be all over the place. And we'll see later when we look at airborne radars that um, the, the complexity of ground clutter in an airborne radar environment. We're only going to spend a few uh, minutes on the clutter with airborne radars and those effects. Uh, a solid treatment of the subject takes a couple of lectures just of airborne radars and the clutter issues. Uh, it takes a, a, a good couple of lectures to do really right. But, but for this introductory course, we're just going to introduce you to the subject. Now let's look at what 
when we really look at ground clutter, what is it? What does it look like? Okay. And the basic radar display that operators had used for years and years, now everything's digital. But the basic radar display that people would use is a display called a, a plane position indicator, or PPI. And it, just imagine you're way above the radar, you know, 10, 20, 30, 10, 20, 30 miles up, and you're looking down at the ground. And the radar beam is going out in one direction and it's rotating around, rotating around. And say you take a picture of the, all the radar returns from a, a revolution of the radar. And you, you, the way you set up your thresholding is that uh, you set a threshold up that's just above the noise level of, of return, just above the noise return. And so, and, and, and what you see as white are targets that you see, all kinds of targets. Targets from aircraft, targets from the ground, from the uh, rain, from chaff, from everything. Okay? And so that the operators could tell the relative range, they artificially put on these displays rings, which are called range rings. And this data that I'm showing you right here is very heavy ground clutter. It's taken from a mountainous region of Ontario, Canada, and the PPI display is set for 30 miles. And you can see, well, it's hardly, it's not quite visible in this photograph. Uh, the, there's a 10-mile range ring here, a 20-mile range ring, and a 30-mile. And here we see stars at the edge of the display. Now, the areas in white are the areas above the minimum detectable signal of the radar. And you can see that out to 20 miles, the screen is completely white. There's backscatter in this mountainous region from the ground everywhere. And it's impossible to see an aircraft in that region because the ground clutter dominates, dominates in size, the, retur the backscatter return. And to see just how big this is, what we can do is we can put an attenuator in the receiver path that attenuates this signal. And if we put an attenuator in that cuts down that signal to one millionth, 60 dB power down, one millionth, we still see backscatter return. We still see backscatter return. This is a very, this is, this is not your average clutter. In fact, I picked it as an example of a very, very, very heavy clutter return area, just to show you how devastating ground clutter can be if we didn't have techniques to handle it, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. Okay. Now to show you, as we slowly peel that onion between uh, 0 and 50 dB, this is a series of PPI displays uh, that go out, let's see, I know, I know this is, see, I know that's about 12, this is 10 miles, 20, 30, this is about 40 miles out, okay? So with no attenuation, this is what one sees. Notice this central area, it, it blooms like a bright light bulb. And that's because these analog displays that people used early on before we had digital displays, the, the phosphorus has a natural dynamic range of about 20 dB. So uh, you can only see with real detailed resolution uh, the backscatter in a 20 dB region. Okay? And um, so that here is with zero attenuation. And I want to point out that this is uh, an air traffic control radar at S-band that's located at the Burlington, Vermont airport. And there are two things to point out. This is backscatter from the Adirondack Mountains. And this is backscatter from a ridge line of mountains. It's very intense. That it's about 12, 13 miles away from the 14 miles away from the radar, I believe. I seem to remember. The order of 10 to 15 miles away. And you can see and it's at two and a half, the beam width is at two and a half degree elevation angle. And so as we put in a factor of 10 in attenuation, 
we start to reduce the clutter. And then 20 dB of attenuation. So even after putting in a factor of 1,000 in attenuation, the pieces of the Adirondack still break through. We still see detections. And we still see that intense ridge line uh, about 15 mi 10 or 15 miles from the radar. This is probably a 10 mile range ring, and that's, that's about 12 miles. Um, and then you can see, in order to get rid of the clutter, you have to put in a factor of 100,000 in attenuation. So what that says is that that clutter is 100,000 times greater than the um, minimum detectable signal of the radar. That's pretty intense. Now let's try to put some numbers with this and go over, uh, give you a geometric and analytical feel for what's going on. So let's look at the geometry of how we see radar clutter. This is in the, in the height dimension, this is slightly exaggerated. Uh, a radar typically, and I, uh, a radar that's ground based will probably have a height of about, uh, you know, 50 feet, 30 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet. And it's the height is chosen depending upon the ter local terrain. But there's a height involved, and uh, the antenna will be here, and it's illuminating the ground. And each pulse illuminates a piece of the ground. And the, the length, the pulse length of the, uh, the, 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 the pulse illuminates, the length of ground that illuminates is CT over 2 with a trigonometric factor. C, uh, it's really a cosine on the bottom, cosine of this uh, depression angle. The radar is pointing down to see the ground. And, uh, and that length, C, 1 half CT times the secant of phi, is the length of the radar resolution cell. Typically, this angle is very close to zero, so the secant is very close to one. This is a very small effect. And later on, when I do a sample calculation, I just assume it's one. Now, when we look vertically down at the radar, we have the beam width of the radar, which is I call theta sub b, and we're looking out at some range. And so this cross range is just the range times the beam width in radians. Remember there are two pi radians in a circle, 100, 360 degrees. So you just take the radians, multiply it by, um, uh, well, if you were just dealing with degrees, you multiply it by pi divided by 180 and you get radians. So this area we're interested in, where the clutter is located, is just the, the cross range times the down range range and it, so it would be R times the beam width, R being the range to the clutter patch times one half CT with the secant th uh, phi uh, thrown in. And down here we see a little uh, equation that the uh, cross section, we call this the uh, backscatter coefficient. It's sigma zero. Now I looked up and uh, I noticed uh, in a first take of this view of these uh, talks, um, half the view graphs had a subscript and half had a superscript. So I went back to the textbooks and half the textbooks use a superscript and half use a subscript. So I scratched my head and, and rather than um, changing to make them all the same, which would be changing the notation of one of the authors for another one. I'll just let's say it up front. Uh, super script, subscript. If you go to one book, you'll see one thing. You go to another book, you'll see another. And uh, anyway, sigma with a zero, either super or subscript, is the cross section that's measured in meters squared, if you remember back from the radar equation, per unit area. Now, why do we make this attribute that we're going to use to characterize backscatter from the ground, why do we measure it as a cross-section per unit area? Because if we had double the area, we'd have probably double the cross-section, pretty much, you know?
So we measure the cross section uh, by a parameter that's uh, the actual cross section per unit area. We use that to characterize the backscatter from a certain type of terrain at a certain frequency or whatever. Okay, and that area is what would go down there. And so if we actually measured with a radar a cross section, we divide it by the area, and then we'd say, aha, it has a sigma zero of a certain amount. Now, the question is, what is the sigma zero everywhere? The next view graph after this one is going to go in, and we're going to discuss that. But first, what I'd like to do is let's just assume a typical value of minus 20 dB. That and what we're going to do is we're going to look and see just how big uh, the clutter is relative to a target. And we're going to go through its uh, calculation. So the cross-section of the clutter, as I said, is this cross-section uh, per unit area times the area. And uh, here you can see I've gotten rid of the secant phi by assuming that phi is 0, so the secant of phi is 1 so that uh, this is the area that's illuminated, CT over 2 times R theta. And let's just look and see what it is for an airport surveillance radar. Oh, 60 kilometers, you know, away from the radar. And uh, so an airport surveillance radar has a range cell of about 100 meters. Okay? And we're going to assume 60 kilometers, so that's 60,000 meters. And the beam width of an airport surveillance radar is actually it's a little bit less for the convenience in going through the numbers. I put in it's about about a degree and a half order of magnitude, and that's 0.026 radians when you multiply that times pi 3.14159 divided by 180, you get 0.026 radians, and then you put all these numbers in together, multiply them all out, and we get the cross section of a clutter to be 1,500 meters squared, okay? Now, if uh, you're flying around in a pipe of Cherokee, a small single engine aircraft, uh, your cross-section nose on is about one meter squared. So that the size of the target, order of magnitude, is one over 1,500. Well, no wonder in that very heavy clutter environment, you'd never see a small target in that environment because the target is le much less than a thousandth the size. Now, in order to see the target well, and back earlier uh, when we talked about in detection, we talked that for good detection, you'd like to have a signal-to-noise ratio of about 13 dB uh, for a probability of false alarm of 10 to the minus 6 if it's a steady target. So and that 13 dB is 20 in natural units. I take 10 times the logarithm to the base 10 of 20, I'll get 13, so that's the 13 dB. So for good detection you'd like that ratio to be about 20. So we're going to have to do some processing that suppresses the clutter by this 1500 plus the factor of 20. So that you can look at this as the target to clutter ratio going into the signal processor and then we want to, and this is the target to clutter ratio, the signal to clutter ratio coming out of the signal processor. So you say for this example of an airport surveillance radar we want that number to be about 30,000 or about 45 dB. That's a big number. So you got to do some fancy processing. To, and that's not at all as tough as other kinds of environments can be. This is a typical clutter ejection environment, but it's a, not a trivial thing you do just by snapping your fingers. Okay. Now, how do, well, we've got, we, I've sort of popped in that number of sigma zero, the cross-section per unit area, um, I just popped in minus 20 dB, 0 0.01 meters squared of cross section per meter square. Now, uh, back in the mid 80s, there was a significant effort, effort that was undertaken at Lincoln Laboratory to measure ground clutter very, very well over a whole bunch of frequencies. 
here we see them VHF, UHF, LB, and going from uh, you know a meter and a half down to 0.03 meters. A lot of different wavelengths and a lot of different areas. The cross section was me measured at uh, 42 sites in uh, Canada and the United States, and the types of environments. There was uh, you know wheatland, uh, you know where there was just like the like Kansas, so to speak. There was desert. There was uh, forested, mountainous terrain. You can see up in the uh, the mountainous area of Canada. Uh, there were all sorts of different terrains picked. Uh, even some data was taken uh, overlooking the sea to measure sea clutter, actually. Which, but a, a very extensive environment, most of it involving land clutter, was undertaken. And it was archived on then, if you think of the mid-80s, it wasn't a few ray disks. It was on gazillions of magnetic tapes. And that data uh, was analyzed very, very extensively. Uh, this fellow, Barry Billingsley, uh, spent a good part of his uh, career analyzing that data. And uh, here we have um, this photograph is from one of his major technical reports. But uh, Barry also, uh, in the past few years, had put out a textbook. Uh, not a textbook, I'd say, but a, a researcher's book on everything he's learned about ground clutter. And man, if I have a problem with ground clutter, I go to Barry or his book, now that he's retired and working part-time. Anyway, um, and one of the things that he added to the to the, uh, the body of knowledge of radar is to look at the clutter physics very carefully and look at what are the different pieces that come into play and try to break down and understand the influence of the polarization, the influence of the terrain type, the physics of what was going on, the depression angle, uh, the frequency of the radar, the size of the resolution cells, all those different things. I'm going to read the next few graphs or two show you some of those different effects. Here we see a radar up on a hill and it's emitting a beam and here's the depression angle down of one bit of energy in that be uh, say this is the center of the beam. Um, if it hits this tree area there's going to be some what we'll call micro shattering. That is to say you don't see this ground clutter because the tree is in the way. You don't see this piece of ground clutter because this piece of the hill is in the way. So there's a shadowing effect. This building shadows the land behind it and consequently behind this edge of the hill you don't see this micro shadowing. So that's one area. And you notice in Barry's book as opposed to other books he uses a, super, a superscript on the Sigma Zero for the clutter coefficient. Um, and let's see it also depends on the range and on the height so and the depression angle that you're looking down so these are all the so to speak the variables that come into play into how the physics of the backscatter would evolve now there are a bunch of other factors one of them is the propagation you can have multipath lobing which can reinforce and uh, minimize detection at different angles so multipath can come into play and because multipath is dependent and as you remember back from your um, propagation lecture it's dependent on frequency and so uh, multipath is something also when you measure the sigma zero you can't unfold it and the multipath and the propagation is all taken up into when we measure the clutter strength we just don't measure sigma zero uh, we measure sigma zero and a propagation factor and it's to the fourth power because of the range. Now, because it's a radar, you have the, like the R to the fourth factor in sensitivity. And so we have the propagation factor coming into play. To uh, the, Now, then again we have these three other general characteristics, characteristics that come into play the frequency, the characteristics of the radar, its frequency, and the spatial resolution. The geometry, whether you how deep, deep far down you're looking, and in range, height, will 
play back into what is the depression angle. And then the terrain type. What kind of land cover do we have? Is it a sandy desert area? Uh, is it an urban area, forested, mountainous? So you want to break down when you collect data at all these different types. And you would like to collect data at different frequencies with the same terrain type, different geometries with the same terrain type. You have a cursive dimensionality that you want to collect too. You like to collect all the data. You can't, so you collect too much still. And break it all down later on. And if I had to take all of Barry's work, put it in one view graph, this is it. It's where he plotted, and well, this is just for rural sites. It doesn't look at urban sites. It doesn't look at mountainous. But they're similar. It plots the mean of the backscatter times that propagation factor that you can't take out uh, for uh, any, and again, for different range resolutions and polarizations, you get a swath of mean backscatter at VHF, UHF, L band, S band, the next band, excuse me, all of these are the five different frequencies that data was measured, and these are at 36 different rural sites. Now, and for these 36 different rural sites, you notice that's a band of backscatter that you get, of mean ground clutter strength, characterized by the sigma zero f to the fourth power. And what it says to me, guy who likes to design radars, if I wanted to design a radar at X band, I'd make sure I designed the radar to handle, say, a minus 18 dB sigma zero with the F thrown in, you know, the F to the fourth thrown in, so that was going to operate in rural sites. So this is the, the kind of ex very extensive encyclopedic data and its analysis that came out of that, and it uh, gives you a good feel of how ground clutter now can vary with all these different... Now we're going to start part two of lecture seven, Radar Clutter and Chaff in the Introduction to Radar Systems course. Now let's move on to sea clutter. Sea clutter is very different than ground clutter. And, an, and there are a couple of sort of bumper stickers, points I'd say up front. The first is it's a lot less intense. It's about a hundred times less intense than ground backscatter. That's the good news. There's always bad news. The bad news is is that um, the ocean moves. So you've got, and the ocean moves with the wind. So you, you're going to have uh, a motion of the backscatter because a lot of what you're reflecting off of are waves. And, a lot, and the waves will move at 10, 15, 20 knots, 30 knots, and of course at very high sea levels, we call them sea states, it'll be a lot more, um, you, you're going to have a Doppler, significant Doppler. And particularly if you're in a sea environment, there's a good chance you're going to be on a ship, and so you're going to have the, the Doppler of the ship thrown into play. Now what are the other variables? Well, we've got the wind and the weather, as I said, and how we characterize that is by sea state, and I'll go over that in a minute. You also have the frequency and the polarization. And just to take a look at that, um, and there are all kinds of graphs like this. This is data of the mean cross-section per unit area. Again, this is a cross-section per unit area because you're looking down at an area on the surface, albeit the sea, as a function of the grazing angle that you're looking down at and its measurements that were taken by the Naval Research Laboratory. And uh, these are smooth curves that are hand-drawn through the different data. The wind speeds 10 to 20 knots. This varies somewhat with the wind speed. And it's taken for two har uh, polarizations, horizontal and vertical. And what this clearly says to you, if you don't want, uh, if you're operating at grazing angles below 30 degrees, the clutter will be a lot lower if I have on my radar a horizontal polarization. So that's one thing you could might see. It's like a, a message the clutter can have for you. 
and the uh, clutter can depend on the resolution of the radar, it will depend, and the cross-range resolution. You can clearly see that the clutter cross-section depends on the grazing angle. If you're looking at very high grazing angles, the clutter is extremely strong. There's a factor of 40 dB between the uh, zero grazing angle and 90 degree grazing angle when you're looking straight down. And there's just a lot of variables. Now let's just mention, so if you're not familiar with C-State, uh, the World Meteorological Organization has developed uh, a table that's world recognized as how rough the sea is. And radars, uh, ships are speci specified that they, uh, they uh, like m naval ships, it, the radar ship shall do its mission in Sea State 5, you know. If it's Sea State 6, you want to batten down the hatches and try to get to Sea State 5, usually. And you can see these Sea States are characterized by uh, a range of wave height and a range of wind velocities, and then a descriptive term. Okay, so that um, it, uh, when radars are built, typically uh, in a naval env environment, they're built to operate up through Sea State 5. In civilian radars, they may be less. Okay. Now, there's one clutter attribute that's unique to the sea that I want to mention about, and that is what is phenomenologically called sea spikes. And this is uh, the best way to characterize these phenomenologically is to show you some data. Uh, researchers Lewis and Irv Olin at Naval Research Laboratory uh, collected this data. It's at a grazing angle of a degree and a half horizontal polarization, and here's the radar cross-section going from 0 to 10 meters squared. So you can see it's down low most of the time, but then for periods of a second or two or three, the cross-section that you see from the sea, no pun intended, goes up to near a little bit below 10 meters squared, quite significant. Okay, So at, the, at low grazing angles, sharp sea clutter peaks known as sea spikes appear. And these sea spikes can cause excessive false detections in the radar. And they can cause you, because you send a, if you get a detection, you send out, if, particularly if you have a phased array radar that can go boom, 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 boom with pulses to see if there's target. You want to measure its velocity very quickly to see if it's coming at a, a ship, a destroyer, or a cruiser very quickly. You send out those confirming pulses, and you'll see confirming pulses for but then they go away. And so it's an issue that, um, that exists and need, need to, needs to be handled because they actually exist. Now, um, uh, the other thing I'd like to say is just phenomenologically what, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, discussion about what these actually are. And um, my best guess is, is that if you look out at the sea and you have a fairly uh, robust sea, that you have waves. And the waves go, go up in a curved area, you know, in a curved area. And what you're seeing is the collective, coherent reflection of a wave or two. Then you, a good portion of the length of, of a pulse, maybe, enough so that they're, for a, a little piece of time, you get a good solid backscatter, and then you, you things uh, interfere with one another. But it's obviously a physical phenomenon that's out there in the ocean that naval radars need to deal with and do deal with. Okay, now it's time to start the next section. We're going to start first with rain. Now rain is a little bit different than um, sea clutter or land clutter in that it's a volumetric clutter. Now rain both attenuates and reflects radar signals. Just imagine a big rain cloud out there. The electromagnetic energy goes through the rain cloud and it scatters, so there's going to be a little less energy after you go through the rain cloud 
So that's a loss that occurs in the radar equation. But it also reflects energy back to the radar. Problems occur with rain. They lessen dramatically with longer wavelengths, lower frequencies. And that's because, if you remember back to the cross-section lectures, the cross-section of rain depends on the size of the raindrops. And when the wavelengths of the radiation of the radar get very small and they get near raindrop size or they approach raindrop size, things get large and resonant. And when the wavelengths of the radar are much larger, then rains backscatter drops down significantly. What this means is that rain is much less of an issue at L band, 23 centimeter wavelength, than at X band, 3 centimeter wavelength. And rain is diffuse clutter. It isn't, uh, it's diffuse windblown clutter, I call it. It travels horizontally with the wind, and it has a mean Doppler velocity, and that Doppler velocity has a spread. This cartoon shows the, uh, a beam, electromagnetic wave going out, and refracting inside the raindrop, reflecting back, and then ref ref reflecting out of it. So what you're seeing is the reflection inside the raindrop. Okay. Now here's what rain looks like on a PPI, a plane position indicator display. Uh, and this is a radar located in Atlantic City, New Jersey at the FAA's test center. It's an S-band radar and the radar has a sensitivity to see a one square meter target at 60 nautical miles. And we see here the uh, buildings on Atlantic City. Uh, it's actually located in Absecon, New Jersey, very near Atlantic City. And this little line is actually a lot of distinct detections of the towers of electrical lines, high power electrical lines. Okay? Now, th th this is on a clear day, no rain. There's some ground clutter here. South Jersey is relatively flat. Okay? Now, over here, we see a, a PPI of the same geographic location when very heavy rain. This was taken in August of 1975. See? This is what a rain cloud would look like, and it would move across slowly at whatever the uh, prevailing winds are taking the rain through the region. In this case, we'll see later in Lecture 8 that this was extremely heavy rain. Okay. Now, when we look at the backscatter of rain, we characterize it with a backscatter per unit volume, because as you can imagine, since it's a volumetric clutter, the larger the volume, the more uh, that you got more rain you're going to see. And so, for a drizzle, which characterizes it's about a quarter of a millimeter an hour uh, at S band uh, minus 102 uh, dB meters squared per meter cubed of volume. And so, these coefficients, which are roughly good to about 2 or 3 dB are, uh, are, are good numbers to use. And then you can see that rain varies at S-band. It uh, varies from a light drizzle to heavy rain, 30 dB. Okay. Now, the reflectivity across wavelength, because it's a relatively simple uh, to calculate, uh, the rain reflectivity varies as the frequency to the fourth power or one over the lambda to the fourth power. And that's how the rain clutter is an issue at S-band at these uh, uh, air traffic control radar frequencies, but a very significant one at X-band and even more. You can see that uh, it's over a hundred times uh, much more intense a light drizzle is at 35 gigahertz and at, um, at X band. And at heavy rain, it's uh, two orders of magnitude. So you can easily see this two orders of magnitude from going from 9 to 35 gigahertz. Yeah, more intense at K band, 35 gigahertz.
Okay, now what does the Doppler spectrum look like? If you take uh, a, uh, an SBN, air traffic control radar, and you just point it in one direction, you don't have it rotating at that 12 RPM, but point it in one direction and look at an individual range cell and you look at the Doppler spectrum that you see, when there's nothing there, you just see down here at a, this is at a relative scale of dB, but a dB, but a relative, it is an, an absolute measurement of cross-section. But uh, you see the noise level is down around 75, okay? But when it's raining, as it was when the azimuth was at 90 degrees on this particular day, you can see that the uh, rain is not down at 75, but it's more up near 50, minus 50 dB. Okay. And, the, uh, and likewise, when you turn just a little bit over 90 degrees, it, well, let's see, uh, 320, 40, and 90, 130 degrees, we see the the uh, Doppler moved in this direction, and then we move another 10 degrees over, and we see the Doppler distribution is even different. So one of the things that you have here, and you notice rain is, first of all, it isn't Gaussian. The mean velocity varies as the storm moves by the radar. And this was an example of rain that was about 20 millimeters an hour. The winds were 30 knots on the ground and 50 knots at 6,000 feet. Okay, and there was a spread of about six knots to the Doppler velocity. Okay, that'd be full width at half max at 3 dB down. That'd be the width 3 dB, 3 dB down. This data was this was just a curve fit by hand. And you can, you, so you can see it's bimodal. And another thing is that just think of a rain cloud moving towards, uh, towards you. If it's moving towards you, it's going to have a strong Doppler. If the rain cloud is moving tangentially, the average Doppler of the rain will be zero, much like at, the, at this 90 degree case. And if it's moving towards you pretty much uh, towards you or away from you, 330 degrees, you see this kind of an effect. So the rain can move all over the Doppler space. And notice that here is zero Doppler, and here is plus 60 knots, and here is minus 60 knots. Now you can see here that the Doppler, because of the pulse repetition rate of the radar, the ability of this radar to see, measure unambiguously the Doppler is impeded. We, 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 this radar be, it can only see plus or minus 60 knots. And we'll go into the details of that, this blind speeds and, uh, and also ambiguous range issues in the next. But notice that the downside of the Doppler here when its velocity is, is negative, minus 60 knots, shows up here as a positive Doppler. So one of the things that you'll notice as you is that there's a folding over effect that occurs in many radars. And this is an example of it. I'll just note it in passing. We'll examine it in a lot more detail later. Okay. Now on to chaff. I mentioned earlier that chaff is aluminum foil. Uh, it's large numbers of dipoles that can be metallic or uh, lightweight substances that are metallic coated. We want high reflectivity per pound and the optimum length is a half wavelength, a dipole. You get the biggest cross section per pound. And what you do is you eject these, lots of them, and, move the, and they move out with the wind. And the uses of chaff, uh, first you can make a mask a giant area that can shield aircraft or missiles in or near a cloud. You can put up uh, deception chaff, it's called, a little puff of chaff to emulate a missile or an aircraft and have a tracking radar. It would, it would cause false detections. 
and take a tracking radar off track of the actual aircraft and it would track the chaff. And packets of chaff can divert that radar tracker from the target, as I just mentioned. Okay. Now, what's the cross-section? Uh, and these are uh, numbers that are taken uh, from open literature. These were published also in Fred Nathanson's uh, classic book. Uh, resident metallic dipoles have a cross-section of 0.18 times lambda squared and meters squared. So mm -hmm. if you take a dipole and just take its wavelength, square it, its, its wavelength in meters squared, that'll give you the cross-section of one, but you want to put out an awful lot. And the bandwidth typically is about 10 or 15 percent. And if you take lightweight aluminum thin dipoles, they tend to drop it oh, from a half to three meters per second. It takes quite a while for them to drop. For aluminum foil dipoles, which are a thousandth of an inch long, a thousandth of an inch thick, hundred by a hundredth of an inch, and a half a wavelength long. Here's one of those rules of thumb that engineers have. The cross section is 3,000 times the weight in pounds divided by the frequency in gigahertz. And that's the total cross section of the chaff. So you could say if you have 400 pounds of chaff and it's an S band, you can generate a quarter of a million meters squared in cross section and you can sprinkle that out. So if you put in each range cell, uh, a thousand meters squared of cross-section, you can wipe out 256 range asthma cells with with 400 pounds of chaff, or at least raise the cross. You know, it appears as though as that there's a thousand meters squared cross-section there, which one has to deal with. Now, what do these chaff dispersing system systems look like? Um, uh, this particular one is uh, it's a relatively old one. Again, it's taken from the open literature. It was uh, republished in several places, and one of them is in uh, uh, Fred Nathanson's book. And it's been re re uh, redrawn. Uh, it, it, the check is, is put out sometimes in boxes and sometimes in rolls. These look like uh, uh, toilet tissue, literally, but they're a little the dipoles unroll and uh, a little motor unrolls this roll of chaff and it's set to pre-set lengths and to disperse it uh, a rather unique uh, method is used. At the, this is a pod that would be on the wing of a plane or, or the underbelly of a plane uh, typically a wing though and air would go ramming in to the, at, at say 600 miles an hour, 500 miles an hour, and it would go down a tube, and then just as the um, the chaff came off the the roller, the the, the 600 mile an hour um, jet of air would impinge on that chaff just as it exits, and with a great flare of turbulence. And so it would just bloom the chaff all over the place. Give it all sorts of, and the chaff would just bloom all over the place. Okay, now I'm going to show you what chaff looks like. And here we see a movie. It's speeded up many times. This was a, a chaff drop done at uh, Atlantic City. You can see very quickly, uh, it's about 35 times real time. Each one of these clicks and the clicker over on the right is 4.7 seconds. And you can see the chaff is blown by the wind and it, it's filling up a big chunk of the area. And in this case, it was about 400 pounds of chaff dropped as fast as the airplane could drop it. Let's look at it one more time. And this is the airplane going out, dropping the chaff behind it, taking a dog leg to the left, to the right, excuse me. And then it finished dropping it when we're on its business, and then you can see as the chaff drops, the wind is just blowing it out over the area with cross sections that were uh, a thousand times greater than the ambient noise level of the radar. Okay.
Now let's go on to birds and in in insects. That I call it the, the funny part of clutter. Okay, first, there are lots of birds. We all know there are lots of birds. People all over the United States go out and look for very single rare birds. And we know there are thousands upon tens of thousands of species of birds. And one of the things they, they, they do is, uh, and I have a couple of view graphs here to point out that they, um, even if you look at a simple single bird, they really travel an awful lot. So they're up in the air a lot. And uh, here we have a, the gadwall and uh, where it breeds in winters, it just they just fly back and forth every spring and every summer. And here the northern flicker, um, it breeds up north and then they come down and they winter down in the Gulf. And each different, the Virginia reel breeds up here and then comes down to winter along the Gulf. And uh, during the breeding season in the Gulf Coast, uh, sea and, and wading bird colonies are exist with up to 60,000 birds, 10,000 are common in a colony. And these birds each weigh a kilogram and they have a wing spread uh, from three quarters to several meters. In other words, they're, they're pretty good sized physical entities. Here's another set of birds. Um, and uh, one set of blackbirds, 63 blackbird roosts were found in the Mississippi Valley, each having a million birds in them. Okay, and these birds go out 30 miles every day for feeding. So birds are all over the place. Uh, a couple of other bits of information I point out. In the fall, millions of birds leave New England and they go out over the Atlantic they go up to 17,000 feet and they fly and some of them land in Cuba and others go down and they land in northern South America. And this has been validated by radar ornithologists who used tracking radars up and down the coast to follow that incredible journey. Just incredible. Um, most European birds migrate to Africa over a seven or eight week period in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the fall and they come back in the spring. So the Mediterranean, what, what we think of as a bird clutter free region because it's hundreds of miles by a thousand miles. Now, significant portion of the time there are incredible numbers of birds migrating and uh, the number of birds per square mile, the density of migrating birds, it varies from one per square mile up to um, a thousand per square mile. So if you've got a radar that's roughly, that sees, say, uh, you know, 100 miles by 100 miles, 3,000 3, square miles, and you multiply that times 100, that's the number of birds in your coverage. Well, the next thing you can say is, well, bird cross-sections are real small. No. A lot of the time, the bird cross-sections are up in, uh, in the region such that if there'll be enough of them in the cell, the radar cell, that you'll see them quite readily. Because you have, if, uh, you, because you have so many birds in the coverage, enough of them have a cross-section that's big enough to see. And uh, they also have a radial velocity. They, they just go in with the wind. To, they're very efficient entities. So even though they're very small, their echoes are small, they're relatively small individually, the densities are so great that birds can often overload radars with false targets. And since the birds move relatively low velocities, their speed, if measured, can be used to threshold out the low velocity birds. But they still can be a problem. Excuse me. Now here we see uh, output from an airport surveillance radar in Dallas, Texas during a time of particularly strong uh, bird migration. And these radar uncorrelated returns that you see moving from south to north are all, click it again, are all birds detections that are 
leaking out of the system. Now, luckily, we've got the beacons on the aircraft. You can see that um, that uh, this color, and you can see that they're, they're from aircraft. And what are displayed here are the last ten scans of the radar. So the the a clear aircraft would be a a, a, a little worm that's that color. It'd have a radar and a beacon returns, but you can see a lot of birds. And this is the, you know, one of the worst days in several years. Not several years, but the worst day or two of a year down in Dallas. It's like that when the birds are migrating. So birds are a significant issue for our radars. So let's just recapitulate very quickly about birds. Uh, birds are actually moving point targets and their velocities are usually less than 60 knots. They have a mean cross-section that's small but a fraction of the birds. Their cross-section can fluctuate up to high enough aircraft-like levels and their cross-sections are resonant at S and L band. There are lots of birds per square mile from 10 to 1,000 and for many radars particularly radars that are looking at targets that have small cross-sections, they can have be a significant false target problem. And now on to insects, as if birds weren't enough of a problem. Uh, bats are also a problem, but I won't get into that. They'd be down in Texas. There are lots of caves where they just come swarming out. Anyway, the cross-section in meters squared of different individual insects uh, can be are characterized as their cross-section as a function of mass. And here what we're dealing with are swarms of insects. They can uh, clutter the display and prevent the detection of desired targets if they're swarming in great enough densities. Uh, it can be, their densities can be an order of magnitude greater than that of birds. They generally drift with the wind and you can rep a good model of them as you look at their size in a spherical drop of water, excuse me, about the same size. And insects uh, broadside are a 10 to a thousand times that when viewed from end. So now let's summarize all this stuff about clutter. Before we get into the next lecture, we're going to say how we deal with it. The number of different types of radar clutter returns we've been talking about. Ground clutter, sea clutter, rain clutter, and birds we've looked at in detail, and a little bit of insects. These environmental and uh, phenomena, and the man-made ones too, uh, produce a, a variety of the both diffuse and discrete moving st uh, and stationary false targets, and you've got to learn to deal with them if you're building radars. And there are a lot of signal and data processing techniques that can be used to beat these effects down so that we can effectively uh, make radars work, and those techniques will be the subject, uh, most of them.